and I am about to uh, ask you to know that we're recording this session. And um, I would like to tell you that, um, that I will introduce Dr. Jim Kaufman, Dr. James M. Kaufman more formally. And um, Dr. Kaufman was born in Hannibal, Missouri and today lives in a gorgeous place called Afton, Virginia, overlooking this beautiful, beautiful Shenandoah Valley, Appalachian Trail and Blue Ridge Mountains. Dr. Kaufman spent most of his professional career at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He dedicated his life and continues to do so to teaching research and service, primarily focusing on the education of students with emotional and behavioral disorders. Dr. Kaufman began his very big, long, wonderful career as an undergraduate student at Goshen College, and then continued uh, to jump right into a classroom and be a teacher of students. He completed his, he went to graduate school at Washburn University and his doctoral studies began at University of Kansas. He taught, in a psychiatric clinic associated with Children's Division of Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. Dr. Jim Kaufman has authored numerous books and articles and has clearly established himself as a leader in the field of special education. Let me continue a minute. Dr. Kaufman has written extensively and continues to do so today. You may have used his book, and I know Alexander, one of our participants here tonight, is using one of your books, Dr. Kaufman, in his current class in San Diego State University. You may have used other books by him, one in, including his introductory text that he wrote with his colleague, Dr. Dan Hallahan, and that was an introduction to special education, an extensive and wonderful tome that has been alive. How many editions, if you may tell us, Jim? Oh, of the uh, intro to special ed. Uh, the 15th edition is coming out soon. That's remarkable accomplishment. Bravo. Other subjects of major focus in Dr. Kaufman's writing is understanding the characteristics of, obviously, inclusion and least restrictive environment, managing challenging behaviors, and many, many others, including cybersecurity, by the way. Um, if you have questions or comments, Dr. Kaufman is one of the most generous professionals I've ever come across. And I had the good fortune myself of meeting Dr. Kaufman in 1981. And he was, and I still, Dr. Kaufman, have your letter that you wrote in thanks to me for the ways in which I was able to accommodate transportation when you were a guest lecturer at Trinity University. It's absolutely amazing story. But anyway, um, Dr. Kaufman's extraordinary contribution to the field of special education has been acknowledged in numerous ways. He received the Distinguished Alumni Award at the University of Kansas in 2011. He, CC has offered him, has, has um, many a time um, honored him with varied awards, and I could go on and on about this. Um, Outstanding Faculty Member Award at the University of Virginia, um, Virginia Special uh, I, uh, Virginia Seek Council for Exceptional Children Research Award, Midwest Symposium Award, and so many, many more. We extend a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Jim Kaufman tonight. And thank you so much for taking time to join us. And we welcome you and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Dr. Crowley, for the kind comments. And um, I thank you and everyone else who has um, been instrumental in inviting me to do this. Uh, the picture that was on the website was taken uh, several years ago at, Kansas, at uh, Kent State University. And that was before I cut off all my hair. And um, it was taken while I was still in my 70s. So 
I'll try to speak as distinctly as possible, but I'm closer to 81 than 80 years old. And my voice may sound sort of hoarse and gravelly, and I realize that I don't speak as distinctly as I once did. And I have to look down at my notes from time to time to remind me where I am and what I'm doing. Um, the scene that you see behind me is um, the view from our deck where I live now with Jean Marie Badar. Um, and it was it's a scene taken early in the morning from our deck. So there are mountains to the south and uh, clouds are covering some of them and there's fog in the valley. And if you hear that dog barking, <laughs> that's Riley, one of our two dogs. Wonderful. Uh, I'll try to speak as distinctly as possible, but um, I know that my voice is sometimes gravelly and um, I realize I don't dis speak as distinctly as I once did. Uh, I'll try not to talk too fast or too long, uh, too long especially, so that we have time for questions and discussion. And I have seen some uh, people in the audience. I think Mike Gerber is out there, and Demetrius Anastasio, and Bev Johns, people I know well. Um, I can't mention everyone, but um, I saw them at least. Um, sometimes I have to start over or say the wrong word. And so I beg your indulgence and forgiveness and um, in advance of what I might say. Now my title, uh, is the importance of inclusion. And I'm glad to talk a little bit about it and why I think it's important and some of the things that I think about it. Inclusion is an old story, uh, one that goes back more than a century. And I think Mike Gerber made clear in his uh, comments about Elizabeth Farrell, who founded CEC, that she certainly did not have some vicious uh, motive for starting special ungraded classes. So when people say that special ed is a dangerous way of thinking about disability, or it's based on some wrong assumptions or ideas, I wonder what in the world are they thinking? And you might ask yourself, so do, do people really do this? I mean, do they say that special ed is bad or dangerous or you know, a, a bad way of thinking about disability? Well, yes, uh, Dorothy Lipsky and Alan Gartner back in the 1990s said that and David Connor and Roger Slee and others associated with the um, movement called Disability Studies uh, are saying so these days. So <clears throat> yeah, we know inclusion is important, but the first thing we have to think about is what the word inclusion means. Like, so what is inclusion? How do we know it when we see it? What's the most important thing about it? And I think there are two major ways of defining inclusion in education these days. And one is that what matters most is where the body is. By this definition, the most important thing is where you are. It's not that it, that appropriate instruction is not important at all. It's just that getting the individual's body in the right place is more important. 
And the right place for the body is the regular classroom, not a special class. The second definition of inclusion means appropriate instruction. And that's more important than anything else. The first think about appropriate instruction and then place. It's not that place is unimportant, it's just that concern about instruction takes precedence over place. It comes first. It's not the other way around. And Elizabeth Farrell and other educators of her day, I think, knew this. Instruction is the key. It's not where the body is. So um, the second definition means appropriate instruction is more important than anything else. First, think about appropriate instruction and then place. It's not that place is unimportant. It's just that concern about instruction takes precedent as it comes first. It's not the other way around. So one definition might be called place-based and the other definition might be called learning-based or instruction-based. So then we might ask, okay, which is winning with it? Which is the primary concern for the dominant model in particular countries and in international conventions and codes. Now, it seems to me that where the body is defines inclusion for most people. I and my wife, Jean Marie Badar, who is a special educator par excellence, <laughs> um, we have called this idea of where the body is, habeas corpus inclusion. Now, habeas corpus is, of course, a Latin term that's used in law. And it, it, the essential meaning of it is we have the body. So now it's important to keep in mind, I think, uh, the international perspective on inclusion. Uh, not just special ed in the United States. So let's consider the United Nations document, the CRPD, that is a Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The CRPD says that all nations should have as their goal, full inclusion in special education. But it doesn't define inclusion. Uh, Demetrius Anastasio, who's at Southern Illinois University, I think is um, one of the participants in this, uh, and Mike Gregory, who uh, is at Harvard Law, and I have um, written about the CRPD and its Article 24 and what it says and doesn't say. It doesn't even mention special education. Now there's an element of truth to the idea that you can't be included in something if you're not there. It depends on what you're talking about, the activity or the place. And it's true that you can't be included in something that happens only in one place unless you're in that place. So the question is, whether what's happening is restricted to or happens only in one place. So for example, if education is considered to happen in one place, then you have to be there. But of course, education can happen in many different places. So someone can be included in learning without having to be in a particular place. And then, of course, we're back to the meaning of inclusion and the question of which is more important, the particular place or the particular activity. 
And as my wife, Jean Marie, and I uh, and others have argued, it's appropriate instruction, not inclusion of the body, that's more important. And besides, special schools and classes can prepare kids, especially uh, those who have more severe multiple disabilities for inclusion in life after their school years. So that as adults, they experience more participation and integration into society. So <laughs> this whole inclusion business, <sighs> It mystifies me in some ways because, yes, we want people to be included in everything they can be. The question is, when can they be included in education and what does inclusion mean there? In education, not the community in general. So, special schools and classes can prepare kids, especially those with more severe and multiple disabilities, for more inclusion in life after school. So that as adults, they experience more participation and integration into society. So some sort of reasoned human judgment seems to me to be necessary but then there are always these gray areas that people can't decide about. Uh, you know, the people are right on the line. And, and so we have uncertainty and the possibility of error in judgment, which seems to me just <laughs> to be a fact. Human judgment is not perfect. Now, in, in response to the variability and all that that implies, variability and abilities to do things in education, the proposal of some people is just to take away any difficult decision by making a rule that has no exceptions. And this is sometimes true of things for, uh, that are not disabilities. For example, in the case of abortion, some people want to make a rule that is just never, ever permitted. You just can't do it, period. And all of you know people or agencies that don't make exceptions for anything or put such strict rules into place that the fact is that the, the pregnant woman essentially has no choice at all but to have the baby. So how does this play out in education in the matter of education of students with disabilities? Well, I'll give you an example of something written by a lawyer named Frank Lasky. He wrote this over 30 years ago. So there's something published in 1991, 30 years ago. And Lasky was also at one time the president of TASH, the Association for Severe Handicaps, I guess it was called at the time, an organization of, for people uh, interested in severe disabilities. And here's what he wrote. Um, and in this quotation, as you know, uh, least restrictive environment, uh, means LRE and the continuum of alternative placements is CAP. So uh, these LRE, least restrictive environment and CAP, continuum of alternative placements are in the current US law uh, about special ed. And they've been in the law since 1975. But anyway, Frank Lasky, um, said 30 years ago that we should, quote, routinely insist on the homeschool as an absolute and universal requirement. And he went on to say that this would make the LRE irrelevant and the continuum moot. 
Now this is from a lawyer, someone we'd suppose knows the law and why we have it. And we would think that as a lawyer, he'd understand that the idea of having a least restrictive environment depends on having choices, not just one universal placement. And the only way the LRE can be made irrelevant is to have no choice at all, just a single place. But alas, lawyers who want to take away choices people should have are out there. And so are lawyers who want people to have choices they shouldn't have. <laughs> and probably we should think about um, choices that people shouldn't have, or they should have only after they reach a certain age. But the whole idea of choice and alternatives has gotten a bad rap. Abortion is the most obvious case, at least in the US. I mean, so there's choice versus no choice at all. <laughs> and we've tried things like prohibition in the United States saying, no, you just, you just can't have any alcoholic beverage at all. No beer, no liquor at all. We just won't have it, period, any of it at all. But of course, prohibition just drove the alcohol business underground. And the same thing will be true with abortion. If it's prohibited, it just goes underground. If we say, no, it's prohibited, period, we just won't allow it, then people will revert to what some have called butcher parlors, they'll thrive. Women will still have abortions, just not safe ones. Rich people will be able to afford safe ones. Poor women won't have a choice other than very bad one. Now, I and others have written about what will happen if there's no choice in placement of kids with disabilities. The rich can always buy what they want for their children. And they'll be happy to buy special schools or special tutors. But the parents who are poor, they have a kid or kids with disabilities will be hit the hardest. With no legal options, they'll just have to say yes or okay to whatever the school says. They'll just have to be satisfied with whatever the public school offers their kid. So if some sort of special service is offered in a so-called inclusive education, the poor parents will just have to suck it up. They'll have no choice. So I think that in making social policies, people need to think seriously about the options or choices that rich people always have and think about what poor people will get stuck with. And it's true that rich people sometimes have choices we think they shouldn't, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about the advantages that go with wealth and the disadvantages that go with poverty and how we might make choices depend on less on the amount of money that somebody has. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I've gotten a little off track here. But getting back uh, to the matter of inclusion and what it is and what it means in education and how we implement it, I think it's really important it's a good idea for people with disabilities to be included in all the things that people without disabilities do, but within reason and taking into account the nature and severity of their disability and what we're trying to do for kids. And when it comes to school, I think the more, most important aspect 
of inclusion is inclusion in academic and social learning that's appropriate for the student. And I think it's important to care more about what kids are learning than placement or where they are. But to care more about what is being learned than where it is being learned. And then there's the old scary word in English, segregation. What a terrible way of looking at special ed that's done outside general education or the regular classroom. Dedicated is a much better term simply because the place is or should be dedicated to the learning that's different. That's somehow different from the education of, that most students get. If the education is not different, then it's not special. So what would the disability studies or full inclusion only people say? It should be the same, that education should be the same for everyone. And if, this, if the suggestion is that social learning is really important and that's why we shouldn't have separate special classes, think about what it is we're saying. We wanna say that kids, and I'm not the first to say this, Barbara Baton, Barbara Baton said this a long time ago, that we really wanna say that kids with disabilities don't count as a legitimate social group. So the whole matter of inclusion is both very important and very problematic when you start to think about it carefully. Um, and in a way, the full inclusion and disability studies approach to special ed is sort of like what has become known in the United States as the big lie. The big lie is that Donald Trump actually won the 2020 presidential election. It's a lie with enormous implications. Now the ideas coming from the disability studies and inclusive education advocates that I've been reading is that special ed is the problem. It's not a solution to a problem or a reasonable way of addressing educational disabilities. But special ed is a dangerous way of thinking about disability. We shouldn't even talk about it, shouldn't write about it. That inclusive education is the only term we should use. Now they say that special ed isn't really needed if we have truly inclusive education. And they argue that general education can be so individualized, so supple, so differentiated that it meets the needs of all students bar none. Now you might ask, where is this a reality? And the answer is nowhere. It can't be a reality anywhere that has any respect for children with disabilities. The very idea of that kind of inclusive totally inclusive special education is based on lies. Again, where can you find that education? The answer is nowhere. And I want to read you just one paragraph from a book published in 2017 by Peter Imray and Andrew Colley. Uh, these are guys working in special ed in uh, the UK, United Kingdom, uh, they wrote this, and I'm quoting, despite a constantly changing and liquid definition, inclusion has not been achieved 
in any country under any educational system, despite some 30 years of trying. It was no doubt a valiant and laudable attempt to ensure justice and equity, but its failure must now be addressed. Inclusion has become a recurring trope of academic writing on education. It is trotted out as an eternal and an arguable truth, but it is neither. It doesn't work and it never has worked. Now, by the way, Peter Imray uh, worked with his colleague, Mike Sissons, to write an article that they published just this year. And in that article, they say this, quote, we will fail if we insist that this is how we teach and what we teach to everyone, because this is the inclusive model. We will fail if we continue to believe that for this small but very complex group of learners, differentiation rather than different is sufficient. And that's the end of the quotation. Now, I, I hope that education can be both inclusive in the best sense of that word, that is that kids included in appropriate learning and be special for some in the best sense of that word. Now I think it can be, it should be inclusive of all if inclusion is defined as being engaged in meaningful learning, not place. But special ed can't be special for everyone. We need both inclusive and special education. And those who want to be rid of special education are, in my opinion, trying to get away with something similar to Donald Trump's big lie. They're inviting us to live in a fantasy world, a world of alternative facts, of twisted, groundless, self-serving assertions, that have no place in a rational society that honors truth and science and reality and that really cares about kids. Now, Gary Hornby, who is emeritus professor at um, Plymouth University in the UK, uh, he and I published an article earlier this year uh, about the ideals and the reality of inclusion. And I'd be happy to send that to anyone who requests it. Um, my email address is my initials, JMK, number nine, letter T. So it's JMK9T at Virginia, spelled out, dot edu. And I'll be happy to send anyone who requests of me any publication that I have, including things that are in press. So that's, that's my spiel. <laughs> so uh, feel free to ask questions or make comments. If you wanna put your questions in the chat and I'll be happy to share them. And Jim, would you give your email address one more time? Okay. I'll put that in the chat for everyone. Uh, email address jmk9t at virginia.edu. Okay, any questions that anyone has? This is your opportunity. Wow. <laughs> well, then I have one, which is okay. how do we turn this movement around 
to put the focus on appropriate instruction? Oh boy, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I have the answer. And I just, I, I'm an old man. I just keep plugging away at this. I, I know other people do too. Mike Gerber, Dimitris Anastasio, lots of people continue to hammer away at this. It's instruction, not inclusion. That should be the focus. Um, I'm working, by the way, with two of my former doc students, my wife and uh, another PhD advisee of mine, um, about the, this idea of making hard decisions in the era of LRE. I mean, if you're gonna have LRE, the one thing you have to have is choices. The other thing that's a reality is they're gonna be very hard choices. They're not gonna be easy. And they're gonna be people who disagree with you. Um, there's no way around that, really, that, that I know. The, the only conclusion I can come to uh, about the people who are pushing full inclusion is that they simply don't understand teaching and its demands and the nature of disability. The, the range of problems that kids can have and what teachers face. I am convinced of pretty much of one thing, besides the fact that people can always buy, the rich people can always buy what they want. And that is that you can make education much more difficult. You could even make it so incredibly difficult, no sane person wants to do it. You can have, a, diversity is really important, but it's, it's important to understand the differences in diversity. I mean, color, heritage, parentage, sexual preference, age, all of those are differences with different implications for education. And Brown versus Board of Education said, oh, look, you, you can't make education different for kids based on their color. You can't make them go to a special class or a special school just because of their color or their heritage, their parentage, their racial identity, however you want to define that. And that was a Supreme Court decision in 1954. And more than a decade later, when we had this Education for All Handicapped Children Act, EAHCA, 94142, which is now IDEA. And it said, look, um, you can't just give kids with disabilities whatever. You have to make sure that education is appropriate for them. And it's gonna be different for different kids. It's not going to be all the same for one kind of kid. I mean, yeah, we have we have this category called disability, but within that category, you have all these differences, and you have to accommodate those. And it's a very different civil rights um, 
matter than Brown versus Board of Education. Brown had to do with place. It's, it's where you go to school. And, you, you, and, and the judgment of the Supreme Court was, you cannot tell a kid that he has to go to a particular school because of his color or racial identity or parentage or whatever, however you want to define that. But 94-142, which is now IDEA, said, well, there are a variety of places that kids can go to learn. But what has to happen is they have to go to a place that's appropriate for them. They have to have an IEP. And yes, they need to be educated in the least restrictive environment, but that will be different depending on the particularities of the individual. The Brown law didn't say, well, depending on how black you are or how white you are or how brown you are, you can do a particular thing. No, it, it just said, look, that is an inappropriate basis for deciding education. But PL 94 and 142 is very different. It addresses a different difference in kids. And it's totally different civil rights thing. It, one has but little to do with the other. Really, uh, 94 and 142 is not about color. It have anything to do with race or heritage or color or any of the diversities that we might consider it had to do only with one kind of diversity. And that was the diversity in what you have learned and need to learn and how you learn. Okay, you have some more questions. First of all, yeah. one comment, which was, they are grateful that you were brave enough to say what you have said uh, this evening about the importance of specially designed instruction. Uh, there is another, so thank you for that. Another question that says, what is your thought on inclusion in the post-secondary world? Specifically huh. college settings. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, um, in post-secondary education, I would take it. The, the question is about um, college and graduate school. Right, I think that's what the question is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I'm thinking back to a neighbor um, who had a very bright kid with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bone syndrome. And this guy was all misshapen and um, used a wheelchair. And unfortunately, went down an embankment uh, on the University of Virginia property and crashed and died. Um, and the parents were remarking about how he needed opportunities and there, and there were architectural obstructions at the University of Virginia that prevented him from doing things that he would otherwise do. I think when it comes to higher education, we really, it's very important to make accommodations for people with disabilities. The question becomes at, at some level, 
okay, what disabilities? Suppose you have a severe intellectual disability. Higher education is little to offer, I think. And I, I have a colleague in, in Germany who um, mentioned the people at her university insisting that people with severe intellectual disability should have um, tenured faculty positions. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I mean, okay, you can, you can take any proposition to some ridiculous extreme that that no reasonable person is likely to say, well, that's okay. Now, yes, I think we should make accommodations in higher education and other walks of life, like last night on the local TV channel, there was a, a blind sportscaster. He provided color on baseball games at the state level. And you would think a blind sports, wait a minute, a blind sportscaster? Well, yes, somebody with visual acuity would re relay the information to him. And he had this uncanny ability to memorize statistics and circumstances and could provide color that was really remarkable. So I, I think it's really important for us not to cut people with disabilities out of higher education. I mean, it, it, there are, I think there are blind physicians, maybe even surgeons. It's remarkable what some people can do. Here's what we should remember. You don't say no to somebody based on their disability until you have tried. But at the same time, you have to be reasonable. Like, would we want a blind person to fly a commercial plane? Probably not. Probably it'd be a bad idea. Or a deaf person, probably that would be a bad idea. Pilots need to be able to see and hear, probably to protect the safety of the passengers. Uh, things can get really, really odd, really crazy. But at the same time, we need to be aware that people with disabilities have abilities and sometimes remarkable abilities. Okay, here's another one. Uh, special educators tell, tell us that they are forced to only co-teach. And when they co-teach, they must keep the pace of the general education classroom. If there are students who need instruction repeated or if they need a different kind of instruction that takes longer, there is no room for that. These special educators tell me that they feel thwarted in meeting their students' IEP goals and needs, and they ask what to do. Oh, yeah. Um, this former student of mine who has a PhD in special ed is now a teacher in a middle school in Charlottesville. Uh, 
she has a job as a resource room teacher and a consultant teacher. And when she's in a regular class, she <laughs> feels like she's just really a, a sophisticated classroom aide. I mean, <laughs> it's just, what is so remarkable to me is the way people are willing to sell out instruction that kids need for bodily inclusion of the kid. This is a long history. I mean, it goes way back. You think about where this started and... Um, oh, yeah, it's... it's It, it, it's a very difficult thing. I, I think though that at some point people are going to say, you know what's really important is the kid gets good instruction. That's more important than where the kid is in the public school. I mean, and then, you know, there are all the, the, the matters of inclusion and other things. School is one part, maybe the most important part of kids' lives. They grow up and they go into the community and, and kids do have lives outside of the classroom. And it, in inclusion of kids in activities other than education, is appropriate when they can participate meaningfully or observe meaningfully. But the school, the classroom, it, it, inclusion is different in schools than it is in communities. I mean, it's one thing to participate in a fair or in a ball game or something else, but learning to read? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm puzzled by what people like Roger Slee think about about schools and all I can think about is either he doesn't understand what schools are about or what teaching is about or he just, uh, I, I don't know, maybe he just doesn't care does it, he see, because he says, you know what, all means all. That means each and every student, no exceptions, they belong in the regular classroom. That is what democracy demands. Oh. Here is another. I get really tired of right. that. Yeah. One that goes along with it. Mr. Shelton's question is a difficult one, isn't it? It actually combines two not entirely compatible understandings of inclusion. One, as Dr. Kaufman stresses, deals with appropriate instruction. The other deals with social location, place. It is true that there is an expanded use of the term inclusion to express the desire that those with disabilities be helped to be present in almost any social place that we would find every citizen. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> one point of view is that schools are different. That's, that, that's my perspective. Schools are about learning. They're more about what you learn than where you are. Mm, but in, you know, that um, 
I had a Zoom with a faculty member at a university in Dublin, Ireland, Tuesday. And she said to me, well, <laughs> you're, you're a minority voice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm a minority voice in, in, in the whole thing here. Uh, I mean, yeah, um, there are people who think, well, um, if a kid has a right to be included in the grocery store, maybe this is right to be included in school. To me, grocery store and school are two completely different places with different objectives. But, um, you know, the, there are people who think that school is just another part of life. Well, it's true. Yeah, there's a certain amount of truth in that. By the way, uh, big lies don't start automatically. I mean, they, they grow out of a history of small lies. Donald Trump didn't start his big lie just right away. I mean, at first it was small, smaller lies and even implicit lies, like saying, well, I, I'm gonna demand a total and complete um, ban on Muslims coming into the United States. Well, <clears throat> the implicit lie there is that all Muslims represent a potential threat to the United States. So sometimes people say things that are not lies in themselves. They, they just imply something that is a lie. And here is another from Ed Martin, who is a prestigious member of the audience, uh, saying thank you for doing a remarkable job. He gave the example on the higher ed point of view. It does go back to appropriate. The daughter of a friend who is deaf went to a quote, regular college. A professor gave a lecture and a pop quiz. No sign language, no captioning, or written text. Naturally, <laughs> did not pass the test. Uh, <laughs> hard to believe that in this day and age, uh, sad to say. Yeah. Well, you know, um, part of the issue having to do with inclusion is what you think kids with disabilities deserve. And, and this matter of deafness is one that I think is important to consider. There's the idea that every kid, even deaf kids and blind kids should be included in general education. And so the idea is, well, all teachers should be able to sign and they should understand Braille. So um, one of the questions is, oh, do you think every teacher should be a, <laughs> a master of everything? Uh, it's probably a pipe dream, but more important, do you think that a deaf child deserves a teacher who is fluent 
in signing or really knows Braille and training in mobility skills for blind kids. So what do you think they deserve? And how are you gonna get that to them? So yes, you might have teachers of ordinary kids who can see and hear have some minimal skills in braille and signing, but they're not really fluent in either. I mean, they, they have not really mastered either. So is that, is that okay? To me, it's not okay. I mean, a deaf kid deserves to have a teacher who is really fluent in signing. And a kid who is blind should have a teacher who really has mastered braille and mobility skills. Oh, geez, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> Can you take one more question? What are recommended ways to help facilitate inclusion of special education students in the general ed classrooms for teachers who express hesitation to their presence in the classroom, particularly students with emotional behavioral disorders? Hmm. Uh, could I ask you to repeat that question and maybe sh sharpen it a little? What, what are recommended ways to help facilitate inclusion of special education students in the general education classroom for teachers who express hesitation to their presence in the classroom, particularly students with emotional behavioral disorders? Oh boy. That's a, a difficult one for a couple of reasons. And one of the reasons is, is it depends on what the emotional and behavioral disorder is and the nature of it and the severity of it in the kid's age. But I would say generally what is most important is for the teacher to have really good direct instruction skills because as I've written and said for a long time, the first thing to think about it, when you have a behavior problem is do I have instruction right? <laughs> because if you don't have instruction right, you're gonna have a bad problem. The other thing is basic skills in behavior management from a behavioral perspective. Now the problem is, as, as I see it, that a lot of, a lot of uh, general ed, teachers don't have skills in direct instruction. And in their training, they're not taught behavioral principles, behavioral principles that they could use to manage, manage the kid. So direct instruction, <clears throat> Behavior principles, those are foundations that I think teachers need, general ed teachers need, if they're gonna manage kids with EBD successfully. 
Agree. Okay. All right. I think that's it because someone else from a speaking from a 20 year retired special education teacher also said appropriate instruction is what is important. Yes. So a lot of thank you. So, uh, and thank you for taking the time to answer some really tough, tough questions. Uh, we do, we certainly appreciate you being here with us tonight. It is a true honor. Well, thank you. And I, I might say in closing <laughs> that um, we all want easy answers, but there aren't very many. <laughs> very true. Very true. Hi. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Paula, do you have closing? Thank you so much, uh, Jim. And thank you so much, our wonderful, wonderful audience. And look out, please, because we have 10 more of these beautiful sessions that people so yeah. generously agreed to participate uh, with us in making happen. And in October, we're waiting to hear Dr. Saroop Mather from Arizona State University. And she would be talking with us very much in tune with, um, with Elizabeth Farrell. She'll be talking with us collaboration and professional learning in special education. Because I think if anything we can remember Elizabeth Farrell for, we can remember her for her extraordinary capacity to reach out across disciplines and work uh, with a wide audience of professionals at the time when so little was in place. Today, we have so much more in place. And Jim, tonight, I'd like to thank you particularly for all the clarity you provided us on this incredibly difficult subject. One in particular I want to mention is Brown, how Brown is so different from Public Law 94-142. That is yeah. such a helpful differentiation. Well, thank you. And I thank the audience too. Thank you, everybody. And I'm so sad it's 8.07. And we again, Jim, much gratitude for sharing your evening with us. And we thank Jean Marie for sharing you with us. Well, thank you. <sighs> Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Jim. <laughs>